Today, we will talk about servitude in the Victorian era and the shocking habits and practices inflicted on servants in this crazy period. Hey guys, welcome to Historical Gossip. In this channel, we do what humans have done best since we've evolved to be a super aware being. Gossiping! <laughs> In the Victorian era, one of the most coveted jobs was that of a maid or butler in the homes of the affluent. For women, it was also one of the few socially acceptable jobs, along with being a nurse or governess. Women from the lower classes, less educated and refined, generally ended up working in factories or mines where they were paid much less than their male counterparts, who already earned a meagre wage. Additionally, women were considered unsuitable for factory work and were hired as a second choice. Furthermore, the factory was seen as a promiscuous environment, so a female worker engaged in a rather disreputable job according to the morals of the time. It is estimated that in the 19th century, at least 13% of English women were in service to some family. The average age for a girl to start working as a maid was 12 to 13 years, but in some cases girls as young as 8 or 9 were employed. In England in 1870, about 20% of all maids were under the age of 15 and 710 of them were under 10 years old. It was preferred to hire a very young maid because it was easier to educate her when she was still malleable and had not yet formed her character. The first job usually was with a family near the girl's paternal home. Gradually, with experience, the girls sought work farther away with better contracts. They ended up moving further from home and returned only a few times a year during holidays. Going into service, as it was called then, was considered a prestigious job. It meant serving people of high social status, knowing how to behave, maintaining a certain personal decorum and, at the highest levels, organising the household and managing up to 40 maids. The employers usually considered the needs of the servants. The most generous ones granted their employees holidays or provided a piano for them. It was also customary for the masters to allow their servants to consume alcoholic beverages such as beer and gin, along with sugar. These items could be included in the salary. Otherwise, a specific sum was added so that they could purchase these extra items. The agreement also included board and lodging. At the beginning of the 19th century, servants slept in the kitchen or in the basement. It was only later, for wealthier families, that dedicated dormitories were built for the servants. Some families could even afford separate dormitories for men and women, for decorum and privacy. The working hours were very demanding, ranging from around 15 to 17 hours per day. The maid would wake up before dawn, around five to five and a half in the morning, and first prepare the house for the master's awakening. It was necessary to prepare breakfast in advance, check the fireplaces, and ensure that everything was perfectly in order. Moreover, once the masters woke up, the maids would be distracted by their continuous requests and various bows and greetings every time they encountered them in the hallway. Every night at 10.30, the housekeeper or headmaid would start checking the rooms, making sure all the maids were in bed, and turn off any remaining lights. Servants had one day off per week, during which they could leave the master's residence. The girls would walk in the nearby town, make purchases with colleagues or friends, and occasionally, servants could forgo their day off and accumulate a certain amount to take a short vacation during which they could visit family, the servants also saved money to buy train or coach tickets to return home or for personal shopping. Typically, the girls bought fabrics, lace and sugar candies, while the men bought socks, handkerchiefs and liquors. The number of employees varied depending on the family's needs and what they could afford. It ranged from one maid handling various tasks for middle-class families to several servants for noble or very wealthy families. In the homes of the wealthiest, in addition to daily chores, there was a need to maintain in good condition the enormous quantity of furniture, furnishings, silverware, paintings, fabrics and porcelain. 
Therefore, a considerable staff was required, and this could be increased when hosting guests. The household staff in large houses was perfectly organised, each having specific roles and duties and a hierarchy to respect. There was also the possibility of advancing in career over time and moving to more prestigious roles and levels of service. Roles and service levels for servants of low rank included the footman or maid, the chambermaid or housemaid, the kitchen assistant, the scullery maids, and the general handyman. The scullery maids were usually the lowest in the hierarchy of service and performed the heaviest task. They woke up before everyone else to light the kitchen fires, which they had to keep alive throughout the day. They washed dishes, fetched water from the well, took care of pot and dish maintenance, cleaned the kitchen, fed the courtyard animals, emptied the chamber pots, and served the staff during meal. They were the servants of the servants, recognisable by their hands damaged by the corrosive substances in the detergents of the time. One step above the scullery maids was the kitchen maid, who worked directly under the cook as her assistant. If she was skilled, she could advance and replace the cook if she retired. The kitchen maid handled all the more tedious kitchen tasks, routine chores that assisted the cook. She mixed soups and stews, pounded meat, washed and minced vegetables, filled plates, checked that the food on the stoves did not burn, and could also light the fire. The chambermaid, the most abundant female personnel, was dedicated to domestic work and room cleaning. The tasks of the chambermaid varied depending on the house where she worked. In a large house, the simple chambermaid obeyed the orders of the housekeeper and took care of dusting, polishing, transporting wood and coal, keeping the house fires alive, bringing hot water for baths and cleaning rooms. They also had the responsibility of opening the curtains in the morning, ventilating the rooms, changing sheets, emptying chamber pots and washing the floors. Chambermaids were divided into two levels. The higher ones came into direct contact with masters and guests entering the rooms, while the lower level ones had heavier duties that did not require interactions with the masters, such as carrying coal and water. At that time, three-fifths of all maids were general handywomen when houses were small and families not affluent enough. They employed a single all-around maid who worked from six in the morning until eleven at night for a few coins. She took care of everything, from managing the kitchen to domestic work, from sewing pairs to laundry. Everything was on her shoulders, and she was assisted by the mistress in lighter chores. In the more affluent families, footmen were hired since they were the only ones who could afford a different servant for each role. Handsome and robust men were sought for this job, as they had to interact with guests and provide assistance in removing troublemakers. The footman, originally a sort of trailblazer who walked in front of the carriage on foot to open the way, checked the safety of the route, provided light or announced the arrival of an important person. Over time, with increased road safety, the footman evolved into a domestic servant below the butler in various grades. There could be a first footman, a second footman, and so on. In addition to their classic tasks such as accompanying masters on shopping and errands, they took on table service and the opening and closing of doors. They also protected the house and masters and expelled misbehaving guests. It thus became a waiter bouncer. Men were hired for this job, were selected for their good looks and strength, as they had to be in contact with guests, outsiders and handle troublemakers. This chapter about servitude in the Victorian era sheds light on the roles, levels of service and the lives of servants during that period. What do you guys think about this crazy time period and what would have been your dream job at that time? 